What is up, YouTube? We are going to be doing something today that I have not done on here in a while, and that is a music video reaction. But Tom McDonald has just dropped Snowflakes, and it is probably my favorite thing that Tom McDonald has put out yet because, you know, Tom always did that thing, and, you know, not knocking him for it. I mean, I love everything that Tom McDonald has done. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, but he's always kind of done that thing where he sends olive branches to the other side, and it seems like he has really grown up in his understanding of what these culture wars really are and has come to understand that you cannot throw olive branches to the left because if you give them an inch, they will take the entire fucking culture and nothing is ever good enough for them. So I think he's done a really good job with this. I think it's a really interesting video. Now, for those of you who know the type of music video reactions I do, I do not sit here and just talk about typically the music and, you know, the, the play on words and stuff like that. I talk about and break down the socio-political content and context of Tom's messaging. So if that's not really your thing, well, you know, exit that way. But if that is your thing, make sure you subscribe to this channel and follow me every Tuesday and Thursday. I do a live stream. Join me and the Revved Up Rebel Nation for Revved Up with Ram Thorburn every Tuesday and Thursday live at 5 p.m. Pacific time, 8 p.m. Eastern time. So before I talk too much about Tom and then this video here, let's go ahead and get to the intro and I'll see you on the other side. Every time who I am, All right, with no further ado, let's go ahead and play Tom McDonald, Snowflakes. If you lie to the government, they'll put you in prison. But when they lie to all of us, it's called being a politician. You think taking guns away will save our kids from the killings? But you're pro-choice. Abortion kills way more children. If America's so <laughs> terrible and racist... Wow, he's already getting right to it. You think taking guns away will protect the children, but abortion kills way more. Absolutely. I mean, how many kids are killed by guns? Very, very few. Every once in a while, we have those horrific incidents like Par Parkland, and immediately what they do is they come out and they try to take the guns away from us good law-abiding citizens, take away our ability to defend ourselves because their entire worldview runs on an inherent distrust of your neighbor. Meanwhile, they do not care that... Uh, millions upon millions of children, mostly minority children, by the way. I think it's something about 79% of all Planned Parenthood clinics reside in uh, neighborhoods that are primarily minority. Yet they, they scream racism and all this and, and, and gun control all the time. Yet because a, a new a fetus is... They, they have not they cannot see it right in front of them because it is not right in front of their eyes it's not a human so it doesn't count and you can kill that off um it's it's really really insidious stuff but your pro-choice abortion kills way more children if America's so terrible and racist it probably isn't safe to encourage immigration just saying <laughs> wow yeah if America is so terrible and racist then it's probably not safe to encourage immigration yet they they advocate openly for open borders so that people can just come in and take over this nation because they don't actually believe in the racism argument. All they believe in is tearing down the cultural values of America, the tradition and values and culture that America was founded upon and trying to swarm and basically it's basically a uh, war of numbers where if you have enough people that come in here that don't hold those same values and do not have to show any sort of predilection for agreeing with those values to come into this country then they'll have the numbers to be able to essentially vote it out of existence um it's it's really uh, <laughs> but yeah Open borders, but yeah, we're still racist. So, so yeah, 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 everybody, all these people from all these nations, come on in here. Come to the most racist place in the world. You'll love it. What? It makes no sense whatsoever. Just saying, all the contradictions are embarrassing. You know who hates America the most? Americans. Yeah, he's talking about the contradictions. And again, that's, you know, if you talk to any sort of leftist about their worldview, it is absolutely filled with contradictions because their arguments typically are not made in good faith. They're typically made as a way to browbeat and present these gotcha moments towards their political oppositions. That's why whenever you see, whenever I see some, some leftist meme or something like that that's posted online, they'll always take one, like, very cursory 
similarity between two things and then paint them with a broad brush as if they're ex the exact same while ignoring all of the very obvious con uh, contradictions and ways that these two things, the, their analogy contrasts itself and, de and defeats its own, own uh, goal, its own message. But they don't care about that. They don't they, because their their argument isn't really their argument. These people are Marxists, and if they're not Marxist, they have been subverted by Marxism because that is how Marxism operates. It takes a culture and it tears down its institutions. That's why Rudy Duchka had in 1967 coined the Long March of the Institution. That's why Antonio Gramsci coined cultural Marx. Well, I don't know if he coined the term cultural Marxism, but he understood that in the West where People were not as ready for a war of movement, meaning a Bolshevik-style revolution. They they were already happy with their traditions, values, and governmental structures in these Western societies. In order to implement Marxism there, you had to have a war of position. That means positioning yourself within the framework of the cultural institutions and rotting and deteriorating it from within. And we have seen that it's already been, it's already been successful here in America. You look at all of our institutions, whether it's Hollywood, whether it's academia, whether it's our cor our corporate um, our corporate structures, all of our cultural pillars of influence have all been subverted through this Marxism and demoralized Americans against the traditional values of America. And then when you have a demoralized culture, they are no longer going to vote for the interests of the founding principles in the Constitution. They're going to vote for the interests that get them the high fives and the and the um what what is it? I, I guess the um uh, the appreciation of the culture that has subverted them. Know who hates America the most? Americans. Trigger warnings used to be on TV for seizures. And now they're everywhere to protect millennials' feelings. He, she, his, him, hers, them, they. Screw a pronoun. Because everyone's a retard these days. Here I'm preaching Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Screw a pronoun. And I mean, that, that's, that right there is the biggest example of what I'm talking about. Because what they do with this whole transgender ideology is they try to get you to reject the absolute core basic precepts of observable objective truth of universal truth and this all goes back to George Wilhelm Frederick Hegel who was the the predecessor to Karl Marx he was Karl Marx's biggest influence and he believed he believed that there was no such thing as universal objective truth that through any sort of manipulation of the mind through any sort of synaptic connection that your brain can make you can create your own reality you can forge your own truth based on simply your perspective but as my buddy don the pleb likes to say you know put on a blindfold and walk out into traffic you may not perceive the truck that's coming to hit you until you're splattered across the ground but anytime you you build a society every time you build a social conscious that is that that is rejected that that rejects absolute truth that rejects reality the harder reality is going to reassert itself in the end and that's that's one of the biggest issues about the transgender culture they don't care about transgenderism what they care about is getting you to reject the existential objective truth the universal truth that this western society is built upon that it is built upon a the family unit that's why you see with black lives matter they talk about the one of their goals is the disillusion of the family unit and part of that comes because it for a family unit to succeed there needs to be sexual difference there needs to be a man and a woman that can come together and procreate and build a child build a family which becomes then the building block the smallest governmental unit in society and a society built on nuclear family units likely typically has the ability to be self-sufficient to be self-sustaining it does not need the almighty power power of the government to assist them in getting through their day-to-day -day lives. They're able to do that themselves. A society built on nuclear families is healthy and self-sufficient. But when it comes to a leftist government, a Marxist government, a communist government, whatever you want to call it, they always need the people to need the government. They have to be the great providers. That's also why they typically outlaw religion in these societies, because there cannot be any greater power than the state. Um, I know I'm, I go off on a lot of tangents on these because I have a lot to talk about when it comes to this stuff. But when he's talking about the pronouns, he says, screw a pronoun. They've all gone retarded. Yes, they've gone retarded because they have rejected universal truth. They've rejected the basic inherent 
reality that constructs the Western society, and it's all in a in a notion or in an effort to tear that down. A retard these days. Here I'm preaching at the protest that hatred's the problem, but hating straight men, white folks, and Christians is common. Co Exactly. They say that hatred is the problem, but then they turn around and they fight that hatred with hatred. We see that in the anti-racism, the critical race theory that undergirds the anti-racist movement today. It's not anti-racist at all. In fact, Ibram X. Kendi says that the only way to solve past discrimination is present discrimination, and then the only way to solve present discrimination is future discrimination. So these people are not anti-racist. They are just trying to take the racist model and flip it around to, uh, to flip over who's on the receiving end and who is on the giving end of it and it's it's not solving any problems it is just pure vengeance essentially um let me go back to what tom was talking about here and white folks and christians is common Coca yeah so and and again that goes back to hate, hating uh straight men white folks and christians again that goes down to tearing down the traditional values and cultural norms of this society because in order to rebuild in their Marxist communist utopian image which they will end up being the first to bear the brunt of because it's always the revolutionaries to get the wall first um what <laughs> So in order to tear that down, they need to make sure that they vilify whatever the traditional founding principles and the people that, that represent that. They need to tear that down and make the rest of the country resent that in order to rebuild it in their own image. And uh, it's, it's, it, it's really interesting how they do it because things that were once virtues become sins and things that were once sins become virtues. It is an, it is an utter inversion of the cultural values of the traditions of a country. That is how you undermine it. That is how you tear the entire thing down and get it to collapse under the weight of its own chaos is, I mean, and, and all of this has happened over the course of less than a decade. We cannot stand this, especially, we, we don't want this change even over a long term, which is what the initial plan was. But when Donald Trump came in and woke people up to a lot of what was going on, all of a sudden they had to put that plan into overdrive. And it, you've seen it ever since 2016, really 2015, right when they got Ogerfell. I mean, for years, all they said, gay people, we just, want gay, we just want gay people to be able to get married. Well, for one, you have to redefine what marriage is, which goes back to the whole argument that I was talking about, the, uh, the nuclear family being the foundational blocks for, uh, for society. The, if they redefine marriage so that it's no longer about building a family and it's just love is love, well, all of a sudden, that's one step closer towards that. Um, I kind of forget where I was going. I go on so many tangents here. Um, but again, it was it's it's about it, it's about dissolving what once was and turning the old virtues into sins, the old sins into virtues. Because okay, like I was saying, in um, the amount of time that they do it in, there's no way that a society can withstand such a revolutionary change in its culture and values in such a short time. Especially when you have a new form of police. You know, they call it cancel culture. Well, I'm not a fan of the term cancel culture because we have always had some sort of consequences to your actions and to what you say. The problem are the standards that are being implemented are no longer the traditional standards that held this country afloat for a long time. They are now these woke, communist, neo-Marxist, cultural Marxist standards. That and, and now everybody who was living their life as they were, saying things that were totally acceptable and having beliefs that were totally acceptable throughout the history of, of this country, all of a sudden, because they have the institutional power, they're able to ruin people's lives over it and have people living in fear. Well, here at Revved Up with Ram Thorburn, we do not live in fear. We do not live in fear of speaking the truth. White folks and Christians is common. Coca-Cola telling people they should be less white. They preach intolerance, but if you disagree, they fight. There's a race war here. Elections based on fear. Black lives only matter once every four years. Oh, that is way true. That is way true. If you look at when Black Lives Matter is in the news, th there are charts on this. You see they spiked in 2016 and they spiked in 2020. You can even also talk about with, when it comes to Black Lives Matter, it's really only a very, very small subset of black lives that actually matter to them. The 
only black lives that matter to them are the ones that are taken at the hands of police because police, they view them as the ones who enforce the traditional cultural institutions of America. That's why they want to get rid of the police. They don't actually want to get rid of the police. They want to get rid of the police as they are so that they can re-implement the police in their own vision, in their own Marxist moral authoritarian police. We saw that in Chaz in Seattle when they, when they took over that city block and created their autonomous zone. The very first thing they did was put up a border wall and implement their own police unit. Aren't they the ones that are saying open borders for America and abolish the police? You can see their you can see their contradictions in their nature. Never trust somebody's words when their actions say the exact opposite. It's not that they're against borders. It's not that they are against police. It's that they do not enforce the values and stereotypes that they want to see in America because they hate the traditional American values and, and uh, cultural norms. So, but you never see Black Lives Matter coming out and talking about the black on black crime, inner city gang violence, or abortion in the black community because if you look into the history of Planned Parenthood and Margaret Sanger the entire premise of Planned Parenthood was to was to weed out all the minorities from the gene pool it was there to abort minorities that they were eugenicists and Planned Parenthood finally after decades upon decades had to call, had to come out and address their history of Margaret Sanger, but you still see to this day she is often lionized among the left because of her founding of Planned Parenthood. They don't even realize that all of this abortion started out as a racist eugenist attack to get minorities out of our population, and that's really disgusting. It's only a matter once every four years. Soldiers died for this country, and every one of us benefits. Give welfare to the bums and forget about the veterans. Black well, I mean, you, you could uh, you can make your issues about welfare. Now, the veterans absolutely do deserve better than what the VA has has given them or, or the way that they've treated them. And Donald Trump did a great job of, of putting new people in the VA, revamping it, revitalizing it. I don't know that, he, that it's really... As good as it should be at this point, the veterans really do deserve a lot. But when you start talking about welfare for bums, um, I mean, it's not even just welfare for bums. It's welfare in general has been a tool of the state to make people dependent upon them. And they actually use that tool to destroy the black community. If you look at Lyndon B. Johnson's 1964's Great Society and part of the plan of implementing all of these safety nets that they were able that they then went and they gave to black families in the South under the sole pretense that the mother had kicked the father out of the house, they financially incentivized the dissolution of the black family. Before that, only 20% of black kids were born out of wedlock. That was 5% less than white people born out of wedlock in the 1950s. So it was about 25% for whites and about 20% for blacks. Now it's about three quarters to, it's about 75 to 80% of black children are now born out of wedlock. The fathers are not around. They don't give good influences. And then they end up wondering why all of these these kids end up joining gangs and end up in prison. It's because they had no fathers. They had no father figures because they were financially incentivized in order to not be around. But they financially incentivized black mothers to kick the fathers out of the house. That was a racist. If you want to talk about systemic racism, you need you cannot ignore this. This is the systemic racism that they talk about, the absolute desecration of the black family. But then if, if we talk about that as white people, then the left will call us racist because they don't want us to look at the issues that are actually affecting black America that would actually benefit black families, would actually benefit black society. They don't want us to actually look at the real issues. Instead, they want to blame everything that is cultural westernism. And they want to tear that down because they are using black people as a wedge, a tool. They are just a tool to drive apart America. It's really, really disgusting. Folks and white folks divided by about the veterans black folks and white folks divided by the news but we are all the same we are red white and blue ashamed to be american okay that's cool because honestly we are all ashamed of you too Y'all are fuck so yes we are <laughs> oh no the forecast said that there'd be snowflakes whoa you can make us see it your way no way gasoline and propane more flame torch those snowflakes Torch those snowflakes. Use that gasoline and propane. Love it. Oh no, no more snowflakes. They set us up to fail. That's what they built the system for. Put an ammunition shop across the street from a liquor store. 
Now, I mean, that, that is funny. You know, they say uh, set us up to fail. That's what the system is built for. And you can really see that when you look at the the neoliberal establishment that is in government right now that Joe Biden absolutely personifies. And when I say the neoliberal establishment, I'm not just talking about Democrats. The neo, there, there were the neoliberal Democrats and the neoconservative Republicans, and they essentially formed a uniparty. They were a single party that looked out for the creation of an establishment and looked out for their interests. I mean, the Bushes, they were, um, you know, they, all they cared about was go into war and line in the pockets of Halliburton, Raytheon, and all, all their buddies in, um, in the military defense world. But then <laughs> the, the messaging, what they ended up doing really was even far more insidious than just you know cronyism. What they ended up doing was they all had the same globalist agenda, the neoliberals and the neoconservatives. What they did was they divvied up their public positions so that the Republicans would state one position publicly and the Democrats would state the other position publicly. Meanwhile, behind closed doors, they all had the exact same agenda. So publicly, the Republicans would talk about, you know, they'd talk a good game about wanting small government, but then they were the ones that turned around and they passed the Patriot Act that allows the the NSA to spy on all of us, to create an absolute surveillance state, the, the absolute antithesis of a small government. Meanwhile, you have the neoliberals who, for a while, talked about how they were anti-war, but once Donald Trump came into office, they couldn't even hide that, and they said that the only time that he actually looked presidential was when he fucked up and made the mistake of bombing Syria for the sole purpose that the neoliberal, neoconservative establishment wants to run a pipeline from Turkey into Europe so that they can provide natural gas and counteract the Russian monopoly of, of natural gas going into Europe, and they had to run that Turkey cutter pipeline through Syria and um, you know, um, what's it? Bashir al-Assad, the the dictator in Assyria in Syria, he is an ally of Putin, so he said, "No, you're not going to run that pipeline through here." And so, what do they do? They bombed them. But it, to them, it's all about money. It's all about corporatism. It's all about globalism. It really is a neo-fascistic way of doing things. And when you look at China as the model for the governmental structure that the neocons want to bring forth, in fact, I believe that they, uh, Henry Kissinger opened up China in the 1970s as, a, as an experimental breeding ground to form what would be the best form for them of uh, global government. And I call them fascoms because they take the the fascistic economic model where you have the state and the corporate agenda merge, and we see that all the way, all all the time through big tech censorship. I mean, right now we just went into Pride Month, and every single every single major corporation rainbow themes all of their products. The the state and the and the corporate ideas have now merged. That is that is corporate fascism. But then they implement the to, the moral authoritarianism, the moral totalitarianism of communism, which you see in China through their um, their social credit score. And so it is a blending, a merger of the worst authoritarian nuances of fascism and communism blended together. And I believe that that is the model that the that the neo uh, the neoliberal neocon establishment is looking to implement on a worldwide basis. Anyways, again, I go, I digress. I go off on tangents. Tom, Tom gets me talking about this stuff, so I apologize if I go too far off the beaten path. But that's what you get when you follow one of my uh, music video reactions. From a liquor store, empowering women used to be different than this before. The role models got only fans or dance on a stripper pole. Now. I I, I kind of have my uh, my own gripes about the whole empowering women uh, movement, even from its beginning. And that you know, you look at feminism today, and Tom has pointed this out in some of his songs how feminists typically just hate guys. But you look at what the in initial messaging of feminism was, and a lot of it tells women to actually sell out their femininity and trade it in for masculinity. It's it's that whole anything a man can do, I can do better sort of thing. Well. Men and women are not the same. There is sexual difference. There is hormonal differences. There are biological differences. There are, there, you know, when it comes to athletics, there are things like muscle, uh, muscle fibers, quick twitch muscle, muscle fibers, bone density, all kinds of things like that. But when you look at men and women as interchangeable, then all of a sudden what you end up getting is that the feminist movement is antithetical to actual femininity and then 
when they end up not being able to compete on some things and do all the things that men can do, because there are things that women are great for that men are not great for. There are things that women are not great for that men are great for. We are complementary. We are not one and the same. Um, but then what you end up, what ends up happening when the women can't do everything that the men can do, what do they do? They emasculate the men and they create an entire narrative around toxic masculinity and they try to make men more like women so that they just get both of both of the sexes to meet in the middle so that the uh, so, so, so that the women are more masculine than they really should be by nature and the men are more feminine than they should be by nature and of course a a docile and effeminate male populace is also more malleable, easy to control, easier to manipulate. So uh, the whole idea of empowering women, I think, sh I mean, sure, you, you don't want women to be abused. You don't want women to be taken advantage of in the system. Women, the role that women traditionally played deserves more respect than it ever got. It really is a tough job to be a woman, to be the CEO of your household and, um, but it's it's also kind of funny and ironic how feminism didn't become a thing until after the Industrial Revolution and the in advances thereof made society much easier. And you see that a lot in terms of leftism in general today is that they tend to stand on the shoulders of giants and, and pretend that they're flying. And you, you kind of see that with a lot of feminism where they say, oh, I don't need no man. Okay, well, let's uh, let's rewind the clock a little bit to a time when the nation was nothing but frontier. You certainly needed a man to go out and fight off the different tribes, to fight down the bears and whatever else was out there in nature, to go out and uh, you know club the wild cat to death and drag it back to feed the family. You definitely needed the men for that. You definitely needed the men to go out and build the society. And now that it's built, you say, oh, I don't need no man. And you have no deference, no reverence for what was sacrificed in order to give you the world and the society and the comfort not that you now have. And we see that largely in all of leftism today. And I, Tom actually touches on that in a little bit. So I'm going to save some of that for later. Um, but let's go ahead and get back into what Tom is talking about here. I'm a stripper pole. Screw it. I ain't tripping. I don't mean to be me. Oh, yeah, that's another thing. He was talking about how now all of our feminist icons are uh, have only fans and stripper poles. And that, again, that it's, that's the degradation of our culture, and that's the degradation of women. There's nothing empowering about a woman going out and degrading herself. And um, what, what was it? The, you know, the, there's that Kaiser Sose line, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he doesn't exist. Well, the greatest trick the patriarchy ever pulled was convincing women that being sluts is empowering. Meanwhile, men just end up getting to use and abuse women, throw them away after they're done, you know, doing whatever it is they want to do to them. And then the woman is left feeling broken and, and used. And then you have a culture that goes out and says, act this way. They, f they think it's taking the power back. It's not taking the power back. It is just furthering. It, it is accelerating the degradation of women who have the biological imperative to be the ones that are choosing, to be the ones that, that are the gatekeepers for any sexual activity. That is the woman's job because of the biological imperative of her having to carry a baby, of her having to gestate a human and actually having to physically live with the consequences of what might happen. Um, but no, 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 we, we, we cannot actually look at these things for the truth and the reality of it because it's uncomfortable. It makes people upset. They don't, it's, it's, it's boo-hoo, it's not fair. Well, tough shit, life's not fair and men and women are not the same. We have different biological imperatives. We have different roles that we're supposed to play in this society. And uh, the more that they try to even the playing field, the more they end up degrading the women that they think they're empowering. Or dance on a stripper pole. Screw it, I ain't tripping. I don't mean to be mean. But if our children are the future, then our future is bleak. They take an Adderall to focus, hit McDonald's to eat. They're addicted to phones and they take Xanax to sleep. They blurred the lines dividing communism and democracy. In 2021, we paint the patriots as Nazis. All right, he says they blurred the lines between communism and democracy. Now, that is one thing that I need to uh, take a little bit of a, a uh, gripe with and that America is not a democracy, and we need to start being much more careful with the language that we use, with the way that we describe things when we talk about them. You know, I even hear Republicans all the time will come out, you know, Liz Cheney was talking about how uh, January 6th was an assault on our democracy. 
Good. We should have an assault on our democracy because our democracy is an assault on the constitutional republic that this nation was supposed to be. We were never designed to be a democracy. The Constitution was never written to enshrine democracy. In fact, the founding fathers abhorred and hated the idea of a democracy because they viewed it as the tyranny of the majority. It's two wolves and a sheep deciding what's for dinner. That's why we have a represented we have a we have a constitutional republic with democratically elected representatives. So there are constitutional processes, but we are not a democracy, nor should we be. Democracies are mob rule. Democracy is run by the chaos and the um, the uh, foaming at the mouth desires of whatever the masses are tricked into believing they want. Uh, and, and when you look at our culture, the, when you look at our left-wing liberal establishment culture, you can see that what the masses want is not good for America, is not good for our nation. It, it, it is not any sort of based, well-thought-out uh, philosophical concept. It is knee-jerk reactionism. It is emotional. And th that's nothing's more easily manipulated than somebody's emotions. So we are not a democracy. We should not be, be sorry. We should not be blurring the lines between a constitutional republic and a democracy. But yes, we have also blurred the lines with communism because we have not educated people about the history of Marxist subversion, how cultural Marxism operates to subvert our understanding of the world and to destroy the traditional norms and values of this country, and then and then teaches us, trains us to resent them when we see them. So uh, Tom is right about that, but let's, uh, let's be more careful about calling us a democracy because we are a constitutional republic. Patriots as Nazis, the men playing... And yes, they, they, they paint the, the, the patriots as Nazis. And that is another issue that I have when we're talking about the right versus the left in this country. That whole concept doesn't make sense. You know, the, the, the idea of the right and left goes back to the French Revolution, which, by the way, why the fuck are we defining anything that is American by the French? Come on. Come on. We're better than that. Um, but it what, even then, the left and right was not consistent. It, it, it wasn't defined by the content of any sort of ideology. The people on the right were those who just wanted to keep the status quo. Those that were on the left were the ones who wanted the revolution, that wanted the change. So it wasn't actually tied to some sort of idea in terms of this is left and this is right. The, the scale really should be 1776 to 1917, the American Revolution to the Bolshevik Revolution. And to me, I'm all 1776. I am a patriot. And any of the patriots that went and actually fought to kill the Nazis, the left would call them Nazis today. The ones who stormed the beaches of Normandy, who put their lives at risk to actually go and defeat the Nazis. If they were to have a conversation with somebody on the left today, somebody on the left would call them a Nazi because they have no historical understanding of what these ideologies are. In fact, fascism and Nazism now just means something I don't like. It's ridiculous. The Patriots is Nazis. The men playing women's sports get trophies for winning. Like, great, let's celebrate a man for beating some women. <laughs> exactly. It's funny how things come full circle, isn't it? Leftism always comes full circle, and it always ends up eating its own tail. Just look at J.K. Rowling. I mean, she was as far of a flaming lefty as you could have possibly gotten, an absolutely radical feminist. But the, mo the moment she came out saying that, uh, that women are women and men cannot be women. She was the left ate her and, and said, "Oh, she's a trans exclusionary radical feminist, a, a turf they call it." And um, so the feminists, which were once the the darlings of the left, are now the villains of the left, and they have to come. They have to accept that men can come in and invade their space. To use the uh, you know, the, the left loves to use to talk about their spaces. Uh, but so now men can come in and invade the women's space. And that is now on par with the same ideology as feminist as feminists trying to seek female empowerment. Uh, it always ends up eating itself because it is a constantly changing set of goalposts because the goalposts are never actually the goalposts. The goalposts are always 
simply the destruction of America, the destruction of the traditional values. And so once you have accomplished one set, you have to go further. And if that destroys the people who were on your team previously, then so fucking be it. That communists don't have a problem killing their revolutionaries. Like I said previously, it's always the useful idiots. It's always the revolutionaries, the ones who now know too much about fomenting the, um, the discord, fomenting the revolutionary fervor, that always get blindfolded and put against the wall for First. They're always the first ones executed. Uh, but, you know, don't don't read a history book because then you might actually learn something. Man, for beating some women. If you're black, your life matters. You're supposed to embrace it. If you're rich or you're smart, then you're probably Asian. If you're gay, then you're brave. All of that I'm okay with. But if you're white... <laughs> if you, there's nothing brave about being gay anymore. I mean, holy shit, you got an entire month where every corporation in the country goes and rainbow themes all their products to stand in solidarity with you. The people who are brave today are the Tom McDonald's of the world, the Ram fucking Thorburns of the world. I am currently, you know, I'm currently being suspended and about to be fired from my job at a college because they found out I ran this channel and that I speak truthfully. That right there is bravery. There is nothing more brave in a world built on lies to be the one speaking the truth. And to be transgender and to be um, to be gay or to be any of this stuff, to be part of the alphabet community, there is nothing brave about that anymore because you are the most celebrated person in the culture at this point. All of that I'm okay with, but if you're white, the stereotype is you are a racist. Blaming capitalism like that's the reason things are tough. Why you tweet from an iPhone and sip on a Starbucks, you're so... <laughs> Yes, because these people have no, again, it's they're standing on the shoulders of giants and they think they're flying. They want to have every, all of the conveniences that capitalism brought and built for them. And they think that there is some sort of stasis that will forever hold that up, where they can leave the capitalist system, where they can leave the free enterprise system, go to communism, and this stuff will all just stand up because they've never known a life without it. They take it all for granted. They stand on the shoulders of those who came before them, and they think that they're flying because they, th they think iPhones just magically existed. They don't, they don't remember a time back before the, I think it was the Telecommunications Act of 1996 that broke up the, um, the um, phone monopolies, All of a sudden, but for a long, the longest time, the only phone you could get was the black rotary phone. Next thing you know, there's, uh, there's wireless phones coming out, you know? You can, you can sit there and walk through your house talking on a phone. Um, they had all different kinds of designs, all different kinds of colors. The next thing you know, you had cell phones. Then you had, then you had the smartphone. <laughs> they don't realize that it was government regulations and, monop and, and the, uh, the ability to allow monopolies that actually stagnated growth and development in this country and that all of the all all of the luxuries that they have are byproducts of deregulation and capitalism being freed up for them but no 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 they're happy with what they have they don't want to see any more innovation because they do not have the creativity to envision a world of what can be not at all um I, but again you know read a history book read a fucking history book no but then you might learn something Phone and sip on a Starbucks. You're supporting what you stand against. You don't think you are, but a Percocet addict don't donate money to pharma. Damn dog, we're all afraid to speak the truth. And the more afraid we get, the more we hate the ones who do. <laughs> Just like I said, yes. And, and that that's Orwell right there. The uh I think that, that quote might be directly from Orwell. He said though um you know, in a society built on lies, everyone hates the person that speaks the truth or something something along that matter. And that is absolutely true. Uh, and people are afraid to speak the truth. But you know what? We need to stop being afraid. We need to put our foot down. Don't be afraid to get fired. Don't be afraid to get canceled. Let that shit come at you and stand up against it and say, fuck you. Fuck you. You can come after me, but I will not go down quietly. I will fight for what I believe in no matter the fucking cost. That's what we do here at Revved Up. That is what the Revved Up Rebel Nation does. So come and join me Tuesdays and Thursdays at 5 p.m. Pacific Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Live, we go for two hours. We talk about all this shit. We get revved up. We talk about the culture war, and we talk about how to fucking win this shit. Back to Tom McDonald. We get the more we hate the ones who do. You're ashamed to be American? Okay, that's cool. Cause honestly, we are all ashamed of you too. Y'all are so fake. <laughs> oh no. The forecast said that there'd be snowflakes. Whoa. You can make us see it your way. No way. Gasoline and propane. More flames. Oh no. No more snowflakes. We can all get a 
along, but there's no stopping. Ay, everybody's wrong, that's a real problem. Ay, they don't want to hear it, but they still talking. Ay, soon enough, we running out of options. Ay, this ain't going to end till it's in the coffin. Ay, we ain't going and th this is where I think Tom is really starting to is, is growing up in his understanding of the culture wars and understanding that there really are no olive branches to be given out because one side is not operating in good faith. They have an absolute goal of the destruction of everything that you hold dear. You cannot you cannot meet in the middle and come to some sort of understanding with them. In fact, that is how we got to this point is through the cultural revolution of the 60s. Like I, I mentioned before, Rudy Duchka and the slow march of the institute. Uh, the Frankfurt School alumni, they plan this as a long form, long march through our institutions so that they would slowly, step by step, one one day at a time, change one thing here, change one thing there, get get the uh, traditional conservatives in America to give up ground here. Okay, we'll get them to re redefine marriage here. We'll get them to, you know, it was supposed to be a slow evolution, not a revolution. And it is because we ceded so much ground and did not see the absolute bad faith and the true intentions of the left in this country over a long period of time that got them to the point where in 2016 they could just bull rush the cultural institutions, put, put their flag on top of it, that hammer and sickle flag, and run roughshod over the rest of America. And I think Tom is starting to realize now that there are no olive branches of these people because these people hate you. They hate everything you stand for. And if you sit there and you, you know, so it's, it's like I said before, you give the left an inch and they will take the entire fucking culture. You give the right a, a yard and they're reluctant to take an inch. We've got to be able to take our country back and not fall victim, not fall prey to the browbeating and the accusations of isms and phobias that they're going to throw at you. Say, if that's how you define this sort of ism and phobia, fine. Put that title on me. But I'm a fucking American. I know what I am. I know who I am. All the base people in this country, all my friends and family, they know who I am. They know what I stand for. And you will not define me. Fuck you. We friends till we try to squash it. Hey, I don't know how we can make amends or we drop it. Stone flakes melt when it's hot, kid. Y'all are so <laughs> Oh no. The forecast said that there'd be snowflakes. Whoa. You can make us see it your way. No way. Gasoline and propane. More flames. Oh no. No more snowflakes. And I got to talk a minute about uh, the video because Nova did a killer job on this. Nova does all of Tom's, Tom's videos, and she just gets better and better and better. Um, you know, I, I love the whole scene. This I lived in Hollywood for five years, and it looks like this. It looks like this. You see the police barricades. You see you see the abandoned cop cars. Uh, you, you see just the trash and the shit flown everywhere, the graffiti. Our cities now look like wastelands. They look like New York did in the 1970s. Um, so she did a great job building that up, and then also the scenes with all the snow falling and all that. Awesome job. The video looks great. It got the messaging across. The set design was fantastic. So great job by Nova on that. And again, I think I think Tom really grew up a bit in this. I mean, he, he's he's been great. Like this, this isn't any sort of criticism. That, like Tom had any great way, you know, big way to go. But I think that he, he seems to have come to an understanding now that handing over olive branches to the other side is not going to win you any favors with them. You're not going to be talking to both sides because we have such a bifurcated culture at this point. And that sucks to say. It sucks to say that. But that is where we are. We are we are at the point where you almost don't have an option but to pick a side. And it sucks. We don't want it to be that way. But at the end of the day, we're also not going to kowtow to a bunch of goddamn communists that want to destroy our way of life, that want to denigrate our freedom and run roughshod over over us because we know people like me people like tom we're going to the fucking gulags if these people really take all of the institutional power that they seek to take if they really do defund the police and rebuild them in their own image we are going to get kyle rittenhouse i mean kyle rittenhouse clearly clearly self-defense being tried he's probably gonna spend the rest of his life in prison because the mob is going to intimidate the the jury in his case the same way they did the chauvin trial um, yeah, and that's that's the mob rule. 
That's why we're not a democracy. But anyways, guys, thank you for watching this. If you did enjoy this, please subscribe to the channel and join me on our streams Mondays and Tuesdays, Revved Up with Ram Thorburn with the Revved Up Rebel Nation, 5 p.m. Eastern Time, 8 p.m. Uh, I mean, no, 5 p.m. Pacific Time, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And as always, rev your engines, ride hard, and fight like hell.